Hey everyone, today we're going to take a look at sealing natural whetstones. Uh, this can be done in a variety of different manners with a variety of different substances, uh, usually going to be some form of varnish or lacquer that you'll use on the stone. Uh, today we're going to take a look at sealing with cashew lacquer. It is the modern traditional version of sealing Japanese natural whetstones. The real traditional method uh, would be using a, a type of substance called arushi, um, but a lot of people develop allergies to it. So generally we've moved away from using that and cashew lacquer, which is developed uh, from cashews, uh, is, is instead the far more common lacquer that you'll see. <clears throat> now, it's certainly not the only lacquer uh, or varnish that could be used to, st to seal whetstones. Um, there is a form of lacquer called um, nitro lacquer or nitrocellulose lacquer. It's usually used in guitar manufacturing, but that would also work very well for sealing whetstones. And it does have a benefit actually over this type of lacquer in the sense that it, it dries much faster. The uh, nitro quality that it's referencing in its name has a accelerant uh, for the drying process. Whereas this more traditional lacquer will um, take a longer time to dry. <clears throat> now, there are also uh, wood varnishes that you can use um, and you, know, you could also even seal your whetstone with fingernail polish, with clear or tinted fingernail polish. There are some benefits to using a lacquer. Uh, the way that it dries and the way that the chemical composition interlocks uh, on the surface of the stone tends to be stronger and more durable than something like, uh, you know, fingernail paint or acrylic paint. <clears throat> so I do like using this better. It's less likely to crack over time and uh, it will withstand scrapes or uh, dings better than um, a, a more brittle acrylic based substance. But either or is fine and realistically all of all of them are going to be better than uh, not sealing your whetstone. Um, now before we dive into <clears throat> Uh, the different tools that we have here and the ones that you'll want to make sure that you have when you go into this process as well as what uh, some examples we'll be sealing up are, uh, which we'll get into that a little later in the video. Um, the first thing is whether or not to seal your whetstone in general. <clears throat> there are types of whetstones uh, that don't need to be sealed there uh, by their geological composition. They don't have any grave uh, danger of splitting or ingress of water that could cause a crack. Usually these whetstones, um, which I have an example here, this is a piece of noviculite, and uh, these are not particularly porous whetstones. They're very strong. Uh, the way they're made is, is, is geologically is very strong. and. Uh, water is not going to cause any danger to it. It doesn't soften over time. Um, there are other types. Uh, a lot of slate does not need to be sealed at all. And the only reason you might be sealing a slate whetstone, uh, like a Thuringian, Escher, what have you, is uh, to maybe to maybe save a, a stamp or a, a label or something on the stone that designates its origin. And in that case, you can still use cashew lacquer or nail polish or, or what have you. But usually, when we're talking about softer whetstones, um, shale or otherwise, <clears throat> um, Japanese whetstones are certainly going to fall into that softer category. These stones can benefit from being sealed uh, to avoid water getting in through cracks uh, in a different orientation than the surface of the whetstone. As well, uh, it makes it so that soaking the wet stone, you just have water coming in one direction. And then sometimes you have stones like these, which are really soft. <clears throat> and if they're not sealed up, too much water gets in them and they can just kind of turn into a pile of mud. So there can be benefits to sealing softer wet stones and even harder Japanese wet stones 
uh, fall into that softer category when we're talking about the, the broad spectrum of whetstones. <clears throat> Alternatively, you might have a stone like this. Uh, this is a water of air stone from Scotland. The pieces that are uh, solid, like this piece, which has no cracks horizontally, don't need to be sealed. This stone will have no problems. <clears throat> but um, larger pieces of it very frequently do have problems to give you a for instance of that. These stones used to be one big piece and it cracked along this line. Now, you can also see, if we look closer, try to get it so the camera will actually take a look, you can see that there are cracks running through uh, this Nagara that we have here, the slurry stone. And <clears throat> if we were to use this without sealing it, you know, multiple times, eventually, as happened already with this piece, we're going to find that the stone will come apart on those seams. So rather than have it come apart, we're going to go ahead and seal this up as well. <clears throat> but this is a good example of a harder stone that will not fall apart due to water, but it still has the likelihood of maybe splitting because of water ingress. Additionally, um, thinner stones like this Komanagara that we have here um, can benefit from the reinforcement that a lacquer uh, can add to the stone. In such an instance as this stone, I would definitely suggest you opt for a lacquer, um, something that's going to be thick and add some durability over something uh, like acrylic paint, which doesn't really bring a lot of durability. It will bring water resistance uh, to the equation, but it's not going to be uh, adding any structural integrity to the stone. And of course, <clears throat> if we really wanted to make sure the stone was good, we would seal it on the sides and the back, and then put it on a piece of wood or stone or metal to, to reinforce the back of it. Um, the last question that comes up very frequently, especially in larger bench stones, that may be thicker than this, is do I just seal the back and the sides, or do I, uh, or do I just seal the sides, or do I seal the back and the side? Um, in my opinion, I, I opt for all of my stones to be sealed on the back and the sides if I'm going to seal the stone. Um, so for me, it's kind of an all or nothing. The reason for that is a lot of stones um, can potentially benefit from being soaked for a period of time. The stone might be hard and soaking it can soften it up, or it might be really thirsty and soaking the stone uh, can help make it a lot more usable when you bring it to uh, your working surface. If we only seal the sides of the wet stone, we have a whole back panel where water ingress can come through and find any weird cracks or seams and try to exploit them. Whereas if the back and the sides are sealed, we only have the top to worry about and that's where we're looking all the time. So we, we will notice cracks. We can take care of them preemptively. <clears throat> so that's my opinion. Uh, plenty of people though only seal the sides and seem to get by fine. So uh, you choose whatever is best for you. So now that we've kind of gone into uh, the general overview of right, uh, why would you seal, what do you seal with, and what we'll be using, uh, we're going to look a little bit further at the process for cashew lacquer. Um, and uh, Rishi follows some of these same tenets. The first is that uh, this lacquer, as we'll see later in the video, <clears throat> is very thick. Um, it has the consistency of molasses to, to an extent. And um, that can work. You could paint that onto your stone pieces, but uh, it's not going to spread very easily. It'll um, glob up on the stone itself, and it will take even longer to dry because it's a thicker layer than you really need. It's not going to be any stronger because of that. So what we'll, what we'll use is uh, distilled turpentine. Um, you do want to get the art grade turpentine. So in this case, Windsor and Newton um, is the version I've always used. I'm sure there are other versions that work just fine as long as they're the distilled art version, they'll, they'll be okay. <clears throat> and um, 
for when we use this, I will mix this whole can with this whole this whole bottle. And this bottle is 2.5 uh, US fluid ounces or 75 milliliters. Um, so that's the ratio I use. I don't really think it's a one to one, um, but it has always worked for me. I don't actually know how big specifically this size can is. Anyway, if I figure it out, I'll put it in the comments or talk about it in the later portion of the video. Um, so one of the first things that you're also going to want as you're preparing yourself for this to get the necessary tools together is a respirator. Um, I've seen other videos of people talking about sealing stones and they never mention a respirator. They're always doing it inside their house. And if we take a look at the can of cashew lacquer, take a look at this fourth icon there. You see the guy's lungs that look like they're exploding. Well, that's there for a reason. And uh, this stuff is very bad for you. So um, you don't want to be inhaling those fumes. And this is true of all lacquers. If you've ever done any lacquer painting before, it needs to be outside um, probably for a day. Um, before you, you pull it inside and allow most of the smell and the fumes to dissipate. So this is the first most important thing you're gonna need to protect yourself. The second thing, uh, similarly, is gloves. Um, nitro gloves are safe for everybody if you have latex allergies and uh, you don't wanna get this stuff on your skin. Um, it's not gonna burn you or anything, but it is very difficult to remove. And of course, if you don't want to be breathing it and you get it on yourself, uh, you'll be breathing it in until you finally scrub it off. So um, protect yourself easy enough. Um, you could wear glasses as well, I guess, for extra protection. I, I don't think that's necessary, but I suppose if you're really going to thin it down or you're doing a lot all at once, um, you know, it can't possibly hurt. So moving on to some other tools that we are going to use here. Um, is just a standard old paintbrush. The cheapest you can get that you think will work is ideal. Um, you will ruin this paintbrush in the end. You're going to paint this uh, sticky substance on a bunch of stones and inevitably some of your lacquer, even when it's thinned down, is going to dry in your brush. And there's only so many times you're gonna be able to clean this brush out before it's it's done its service for you and you're going to want to replace it. Uh, I'd say that maybe every, you know, two or three uses, you're going to find that the uh, brush is no longer working for you. And specifically because the brush uh, can get dried pieces of lacquer in it that'll come out as clumps. And of course you don't want that if you're trying to make a smooth coat. So here's the brush that I use. It's just a cheapo brush. You just make sure you get any bristles out. I think this was $3 at your local hobby store. I do prefer them to be a little stiff bristled um, if they're too soft because this is still uh, thick even after it's thinned it down it's hard to spread it um, and you do want to with these cheap brushes you do want to work them a little bit if you've never painted before. You're gonna have a few bristles <clears throat> that'll fall out and that saves you from having to pick them out of, of your lacquer later. So this is a fine brush Again, keep it cheap uh, because it's only going to last you a few times of this use. The next things you're going to want are some form of container. A clear cup works very well. Um, and in addition to this, you're going to want cling wrap, which you'll see when we actually use uh, the setup to seal the stones, and a rubber band. Uh, this is because the more the lacquer is exposed to air, the faster it's going to cure. And it's unlikely you'll have enough stones to seal that you'll get through all of this in one shot. So you do want to keep your lacquer away from air as much as possible. With that said, obviously maybe a less tall cup would be worthwhile, but also try to keep the process cheap. Um, with that said, cling wrap and then a rubber band does a very good job of keeping the air out and keeping your lacquer valid for a couple of uses at least. So cheap, effective solution. In addition to that, if you find that your lacquer has been sitting for a period of time, it's possible that the top layer has dried or that maybe if you're on your second or third time using your brush, a 
some of the dried clumps inside your brush have gotten inside your still liquid lacquer. If that's the case, you can get a second cup and put uh, some cheesecloth over the top of the cup and um, strain it out. You would just put the cloth in and then kind of squeeze it out, you know, where you're, you're straining it. Uh, it works pretty well. You will lose, of course, some of your lacquer uh, being stuck in the cheesecloth, but it's better than having, you know, chunky, semi-dried lacquer that, that doesn't really work. So by that time, you're trying to salvage it. Uh, however, it's still worthwhile uh, to go about using. The next part of the tools uh, that I think are useful here are something to put the stone on to elevate it above the ground. Uh, in the case of these nagar, I probably won't do that. I'll just probably put them like this on a piece of cardboard um, and seal them up and then pop them off the cardboard later. But on these bigger stones where there's, I feel there's a lot more of a chance that you get runoff because you're sealing a much larger surface, it has a chance to kind of migrate off the side. It's really helpful to get something uh, like these prescription bottle caps so that you can take the stone and put it kind of hovering um, off of the ground. This allows the excess lacquer to drip off of the stone and onto uh, whatever you have underneath it, cardboard or, or whatever, rather than <clears throat> pooling between the stone and the surface. Uh, in an ideal world, I suppose, you could have right one of these for, for everything you're sealing. Um, I don't have that many, and the Nagara will be okay. But for this stone, uh, you'll definitely see me use this elevation technique. And you can also just use one, uh, but you do have a little bit less stability, so take that into account. And uh, again, these can come from prescriptions, uh, from regular over-the-counter pills, whatever. They, I find that these work best because they're, they're raised enough to be useful, um, but they're very wide and they're stable. So uh, they make sure that nothing is getting away from you. And then the last tool that I think is worthwhile to ensure you have on hand uh, before you really try to jump into this process is a, util well, I guess I'll call it a utility knife. You can see this guy has been used a lot for this task for sealing stones. Um, but the value of this is not when we do the sealing up front, but it will be in a couple days after we've done our initial sealing, particularly with the stone that's been hovering off the ground, uh, you're going to have lacquer that gets on your sharpening face here. And uh, when we get that lacquer, when we go to get that lacquer off right, you're going to put it in a stone holder. It's been about a week, so the lacquer will be good enough to touch. Not technically fully cured. It takes about two to three weeks to fully cure, depending on how thick you put it on. But in one week, you can handle the stone, um, and as long as you're not uh, really digging into it, uh, the lacquer will still stabilize afterwards. But usually what I'll do is I'll put the stone in the holder here, and then you'll have blobs or a line of lacquer all around the sides. And I'll take uh, this utility knife and keep it relatively sharp. And then, you know, you're going to put it on the stone, dig into that level of lacquer that runs along the side, and you just pull it towards you. And um, you do it obviously slow, you keep your hands on the knife out of the way of the blade, so if you were doing it the opposite direction, it'd be like this. Right, you're not, you're not pulling fast, it's just a small whittling type action. And the lacquer's not difficult to work with at this stage, it's still a little fluid, even though it's been a week. You're going to end up peeling off um, all of that extra lacquer. What that'll do is leave still a film of lacquer. You will find that maybe the stone sucked up a little bit or your knife on the stone is not perfectly flat so you're not gonna get all the lacquer up. But that'll make your life a lot easier. <clears throat> um, you know, you'll get that off and then uh, maybe you'll just rinse off the outside, make sure that you don't have any of those bits you, you carved off the front, if you wanna call it that, um, on the sides. And then you're gonna place it to dry for another week and once uh, it is two weeks dry, um, you're going to go to finally flatten the stone out. And that brings us to our last tool, a diamond plate of some kind, probably a 140 
or a 400 could also work. So at that point you would take your stone, put it back on your base. Um, you're going to want to chamfer the sides. So usually the way that I would do that is you're going to take it and you're going to run the diamond plate like that on each of the sides. Now when you chamfer the sides, always make sure you're pulling away from the lacquer, heading in that dirt, you know, heading in this direction. If you pull this way, you are potentially teasing the lacquer to come off the sides. And if the lacquer is not fully cured, it may just do that. It may just pull off the side. Um, so you wanna, you, you'll wanna chamfer the sides by pulling away from the lacquer on all four sides first. You'll see that the stone is perfectly revealed around the sides and you'll still have lacquer on the surface here. And then you're just gonna use your diamond plate to flatten your stone out like normal. And eventually you'll get it so that there's no more lacquer residue nice chamfered sides, you have nice, uh, you know, flat, even uh, lacquer on your stone, and you're ready to go. Um, the same is true for your Nagara. If you're going to seal your Nagara up, um, it may be a little bit less worthwhile, given it's a smaller stone, to try to peel anything off with your utility knife. I probably would just take the stone, maybe use the knife on only really the biggest blob if I'm concerned about it, and then you're just gonna, you know, wet the process down and wrap it on your diamond plate. That's a little easier than the bench stones. Um, but you will need a diamond plate to get this done. You could try to use sandpaper, but you're gonna waste, your, or you're gonna make yourself frustrated more than you're gonna waste your time. The last thing to talk about uh, before we go into actually going outside and sealing up these stones is, <clears throat> um, stamps or labels. Now, um, I have had no issue using cashew lacquer with it affecting the stamps. Um, some people have said that and will use nail polish to seal the stamps before they lacquer, um, but the amount of people I've talked to who have had no issue leads me to believe that if you're cashew lacquering stamps, you're going to be fine. Um, so I will just leave this as is. There's nothing over this. It's just stamped on the stone and I'll lacquer over it and it'll, it'll look fine. Um, I have had a single label, a single small label, drastically darken. Um, so those are not stamps, obviously that was paper. And even the majority of paper that I've sealed in the past has not darkened or caused any, had any issues. It might get tinted because this is going to be a little bit of a, of a brown tint, right? It'll be like this. Um, but usually it doesn't darken the label more than the tinting. And only on one uh, label, the, the blue-green uh, edge label for an Escher got real dark. You can still see it, but it's difficult. So if you're, if you're concerned about labels and making sure they're legible still, um, you know, you might want to use like a clear version of the cashew. That's just this is what I have, so that's what I've always used. Um, so I think that gives us all of our preliminary information and a little bit of a lowdown on the technique that you'll want to go ahead and use. And uh, we'll be filming outside, which is not the normal setup, and I'll do my best to make it something that you all can see, um, but I can make no promises. So uh, let's get to that and uh, see how it goes. Hey everyone, uh, so we're outside to take a look at sealing the stones. <clears throat> As you can see, we have the stones that we talked about before, and then I'll also be sealing just the back of these two stones. They have the sides sealed, but I want to get the back sealed up. Oh, we are obviously outside. You're going to hear outside noises, uh, but hopefully you're able to still understand everything, um, and it'll get even more difficult here once I put the respirator on. But uh, we have all of our tools available to us here, and I actually will be seeing if I can migrate any of this old cashew lacquer um, to our new use here uh, via the cheesecloth we talked about before. It may not work. We'll see if it does. So, first things first, as we discussed earlier, safety equipment. And it's always good to not just bring one pair of these. I have another pair in the pocket. Very good chance I'll get them messed up, especially when we're trying to potentially migrate this. You'll see I'll pretty much follow all the instructions that I gave on the uh, 
video inside. One thing I didn't cover that's worth discussing right now, in case you can't hear me through the respirator, is when we have this guy, the stone propped up on these, and then we're done sealing the back and the sides. Something that I find really useful to do is to take your finger with a glove on and to stick it under the stone and run around the outside. What that'll do is it'll get the worst of the globs off the stone. So if we bring it closer, in theory what you're doing, here's the bottom, it's facing down. You're taking your finger and curling it around and you're running like that. So what that'll leave you with is a, is a layer around the outside you'll need to take off but it won't leave big globs that are very hard to take off. And then combined with the knife, as we talked about before, you'll be able to shave most of that off, and then you'll just flatten out the stone with a diamond plate. So, I wanted to cover that before. I'll reiterate it when we're doing it, you'll get to see it, but um, no real promises that you'll be able to understand. So, I'm gonna stick our respirator on here and get to it. Test, test. Hopefully it's understandable. Apologize if it's not. So we have our cheesecloth. And our new cling wrap. In this case, I'm just going to set it under that nugger. old rubber band, which I'm going to reuse here. Real slippery with these gloves on. When you put it on, you want it to be like that, right? So that it sits inside. What we can do, since we're going to use all of this anyway, we can put a little bit of it in here. And then I'm going to stir it up just to see if I can get some movement out of it. It's pretty old. You can see it's pretty gummy. Um, but we still may be able to salvage some. And if we don't, it's not a big deal. Just try not to be wasteful. Sorry, it's difficult to make you guys be able to see this uh, for this session, but I'm just trying to scrape it all so it's mobile. And we're gonna, there we go. So we have kind of like this jelly, because it's um, been drying a little bit, even to our best efforts. And then you're going to try to take off the rubber band. In this case, I'm actually going to forego doing that. I'm just going to pull it up. Perfect. Then we're just going to grab the ends. And you're going to squeeze to see what you can get out. Unfortunately, in this case, not a whole lot usable. Um, if it can't make it through the cheesecloth, it means that it's 
so solidified that we're not really going to get much use out of it. So that's okay. We could try to salvage a bit more of this. I could use the knife and scrape it off, but since we have a can already, I'm just going to, uh, That's a good technique to use. It keeps you from mostly getting it on your hands. We're gonna put on the gloves here. If the uh, previous stuff we were using was newer, it would have been much more successful. But you know, you try. It at least gave you guys a nice visual into the technique that you would use. So in this case, it's standard, just like a paint can. Just get under it. So here's what it looks like. Now, it's really difficult to get all of it out. Usually what I'll do is I'll take our turpentine and I'll pour it in this can first. And as we can see, it's not quite a one-to-one, -one, but uh, maybe 80%. And that way we got a bit more of it out of our cashew lacquer can here. So with that done, we can go ahead and kind of reposition ourselves a little better here. Maybe here just like this. And uh, uh, all right. So obviously we don't want everything so clumped up. We're gonna move this to a more workable area. Looks pretty good. And give us some room to work on the nagara. So now when we first do it, you'll see there's a separation between the layers. You can use like a chopstick if you want, but in this case we're already going to use the brush. So I'm just going to uh, get it moving here. And that's pretty thin. Um, it'll be fine. If you like to use a thicker coat, um, that's fine too. I prefer more thin coats than I do prefer thicker coats. So you can add a little bit of lacquer to taste, or a little bit of, of turpentine to the lacquer and then test it to figure out what you like. I know I like the thinner stuff and I've done this quite a few times, so um, I just go with what uh, I'm used to. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and start on the water of air. Nagra right over here. And you're just looking for a nice even coat. You can kind of be as anal or not as you want. But in this case one or two passes. Make sure you don't have any pooling as best as you can. And the, uh, the lacquer is self-stabilizing to a degree. So if it's a little uneven when you brush it on, it will even out on the surface as it begins to spread and dry. So that's fine. Now we'll do our Gujo Nagara here. And I'd say we're looking for about two to three coats on the Nagara, and probably the bench stone too. It matters a lot on how the stones suck up the, stub the substance. These Gujo Nagara, for instance, are gonna suck it up readily, so they might require a few more coats. 
this water of airstone is, I dripped a little bit, not a big deal, I just even it out. The water of airstone is very, um, is not going to suck up a whole lot. So we might be able to get by with only um, two coats instead of three plus. We'll see, there's no, there's no rules. Kind of channel a little bit of Bob Ross, I guess. Just uh, go with the flow and what works. Now, um, when we're doing these Nagara where it's touching the cardboard, you will find that it'll stick a little to the cardboard and a bit of cardboard is going to come off on the um, surface we use when we go to move them at the very end. That's not a very big deal because these Nagara need to be flattened anyway. So we're you know, going to be redoing the surface. And as such, we care a whole lot more about the sides and the back. But if I had the equipment, you know, I could uh, elevate them like I am doing this guy, this one here. But I, I don't have many of those, and this is fine. This will work for us just fine. So next we're going to just take care of the backs of these. That does tend to be a little bit more particular, so we just want a little bit less lacquer on the brush. Be a little bit more careful so that we hopefully don't drib, dribble any down the sides. There we go. And if we do, it's not the end of the world. Just nice to have a nice seal gem. Now, I don't have a garage. If you do have a garage, it can be useful. Because as you can see, I got some critters here, some bugs with me. And if those guys land in the slacker, it's a little bit of a pain to pick them out and relacquer that area. And also not fun for the bug. So um, if you have a garage, I do prefer to do it in there, but since I don't have one, we're uh, doing it in the backyard. Now on something like this where we just want to do the sides, you can take your finger and just run it around to see if we caught any. And there's a little bit. There's a little bit leaking down the sides. And doing that just catches it before it can dry. You know, flatten it out on the sides. And that's not even totally necessary. So, we're on to our coma Nagara. And uh, with something like this, that there's a lot of like pockets and chips and stuff, you really want to make sure that you're you're getting in there. You have to brush over it a few times and uh, the multiple coats will help. But your first coat really lays down that initial basis. <clears throat> and when we're going up the sides, I like to just do this. I move from the bottom up at a little bit of an angle. You can flip the brush over to make sure that you're getting um, lacquer easily on, on all the areas. And just be real light. You can saw I pressed a little too hard and I moved the stone, not a big deal. Alright, and uh, we have even coverage on that, I would say. We got our first bug, let's just get him out of the way. And the next step is to wait for this to dry to do multiple coats. For our brush, if you have extra turpentine, that would be the easiest thing to do. Uh, you can also try to spray it out with a hose, but obviously the turpentine is going to react with it. I found that the easiest way is just to put it on the extra cardboard and get um, as much out as you can from the brush. Now again, um, this is not a very expensive brush, so I'm totally fine with knowing that it's going to not be here for me after a time or two right after either this time or the next time, it's going to be toast. But this works pretty well. Make sure there's no major globs in it afterwards. And I mean, I'm going to be using it again here in 30 minutes or so. Um, 30 minutes to an hour depends on the humidity. But we're in Florida with direct sunlight. Oh, it's going to be quick. So now we 
want to preserve our lacquer, we're going to grab our cling wrap, which I have um, double doubled it up just to make it a little thicker. Put it on our cup. Get our rubber band. And then take it out of the sun. This will come uh, probably inside a cupboard inside. <coughs> As will our, as will our brush. All right, uh, pretty easy. We're gonna give these that about that 30 minutes to dry. Then we're gonna again take our finger, put it under the stone, and just run along the outside carefully. And uh, you can see that all would have been globules, uh, globules around the outside of that. <coughs> but we, uh, we now made it a nice smooth layer that'll help us uh, later in the process. So I'm uh, going to step away and uh, we'll do the next coat in a little bit. All right. Hey, everyone. We're back for round two. And uh, as you might be able to see, we already have a pretty decent coat. Let's go ahead and grab this guy because we just did the back. And that's probably already waterproof. But we're going to do at least two coats on these and then check back for if they need three. These guys will likely need three because they're real absorbent. <clears throat> uh, I would expect one more on these are fine. One more on this is fine. Eh, maybe I'll do two more on the coma. So anyway, let's see. We got enough of it out for it to still be pliable, which is what we wanted. We got our liquid here and it, it doesn't tend to separate once you mix it, but it is good to still mix it up a little bit with the brush before you go to use it. All right, start our round two. Let's get that mixed up a bit. And this time I'm going to start with our coma here. So two things, uh, it's not the end of the world if you end up touching this with your finger. It will be sticky, it'll be tacky for probably at least a day. Um, but if you do, the lacquer is not fully set. So um, the fingerprint or whatever mark you leave in it, if you just leave the stone alone, it will smooth out, it'll normalize because um, the lacquer self-stabilizes. So if you end up touching it by accident, it's not the end of the world. Don't try to add more lacquer to it to fix it. Just just leave it alone and uh, let gravity do its work. Pretty easy. And uh, yeah, you also want to obviously make sure that the areas that are wet lacquer are not touching anything because they will they will fuse, they're still drying. Let's keep that in mind as well. Still gonna try to be fairly careful on these. The second thing is um, <clears throat> if you put a lot of lacquer on it, like you see I'm trying to be pretty sparse. If you put a lot of lacquer on it, it's also not gonna be the end of the world. It'll take a little longer to dry, and it might um, wrinkle up a little bit. You might not get that perfect flat coat you want. But if it wrinkles, it, it's not like it doesn't work fine anyway. It just doesn't look as pretty. So if you want a really nice, smooth, hard coat, <clears throat> um, you're going to want to make sure it's thinner like this and then do multiple coats. If you keep it thicker or you leave it to pool, like see how the stone has divots. If you leave it to pool in there without spreading it around, there's definitely a chance it'll get it'll get wrinkly. But again, that uh, isn't going to affect the performance at all. So it's not a big deal if it happens to you. Especially um, on these thirstier stones, you want to do multiple coats. You know, I said you probably could have left these two alone if you'd really wanted. These Gujo Nagara are not, they definitely are not waterproof yet. Um, those stones are harder. 
These are real porous. They suck up stuff readily and it leaves a very uneven coat for the first coat. The second coat evens it out. The third coat kind of strengthens it. So I definitely think three plus is uh, the right move there. But one coat is better than none, if uh, realistically speaking. So you can make your own choice. So I am going to touch this one. It's a little sticky, but I wanted to show you guys why the multiple coats is really valuable. <clears throat> See, this was this area right here that's clearly not covered. And some of this was probably covered with lacquer. I don't think I missed it. But the lacquer naturally contracts as it dries. And combining that with the fact that these stones are porous and they, they suck up some of the lacquer, means that the lacquer can actually pull away from an area of the stone and leave you with that uneven finish. So definitely you want to be checking for that as you're sealing up your stones. And uh, if you see it, it's uh, definitely a sign that you're going to need to put on another coat. The other thing that can be helpful is uh, some of these stones have saw marks on them still. Like this guy here, I'll try to turn it for us. Hopefully you can see it, it has saw marks that run this way. And um, you'll get a much better finish if you work with those saw marks, you know, running up the side of the stone. If you do it against the saw marks or across, uh, the lacquer is more likely to pull against those ridges. So keep that in mind, it's not the end of the world if you don't go with the saw marks, but you'll just find you get a better result. All right, so we've done round two. We're going to do the same thing here. Try to get our residual lacquer out of our brush. We can just use all of our free area here to do that. It doesn't have to be perfect, but the better you can do it, the less likely any of it dries into hard chunks later. And if it dries into hard chunks and then comes out in your lacquer on the stone, you're going to get like a little, a little hard dot or a pimple or looking thing on it, which is not ideal. So anyway, we're good there. And so I'm going to close this up and we'll come back for round three in another 30 minutes. I did forget to add, I'm still going to go around the sides of this, these stones. I don't think I dripped any, but it was good. And then on the coma again, I will go around the sides. And I'm actually going to use also a clean finger underneath to just reposition it a little bit. You can see there's definitely lacquer underneath it. That's what is expected. We can see it's been dripping off here. Totally fine. Not going to cause you any problems. As a matter of fact, that's, that's kind of the point of elevating it is to allow the excess to drip off and then to try to get a nice even coat on those sides. Um, so there's always a little bit of wastage in this. You can see wastage from the brush, wastage from coming down the sides onto the cardboard, but that's okay. Um, you're not wasting that much. And realistically speaking, it's all, not all that expensive. So anyway, all right, I'll see you on the round three. All right, so we are out for our third and probably last coat here. Definitely last on these guys. I think I'm already done with this. I'll probably put a third on this. Definitely these guys will also get a third. At this time, we've been out here for another 30-40 minutes drying on the second coat, and it is probably worthwhile to start for these that are touching the surface to start just trying to disrupt them a little bit. And what I mean by that is, as you can see, it's a little sticky, but it's not sticky enough to come off. We will leave a little bit of marks on it when we touch it, but that will stabilize, as I've said a few times. The benefit, though, of moving them 
is so that it does not get too stuck onto the cardboard. So if we just take them and move them a little bit, um, we'll be better off later for it not being so stuck. So you just try to do it quickly with a rather light hand. As you can see, nothing came off. Those marks will go away. These guys are fine. We're just been sealing the back. This guy's elevated, so it's not stuck to anything. Um, again, I will leave this. Taking a look at it, it looks like it has a nice coat. It's not surprising. I, I didn't expect it to uh, suck up anything. So that one's pretty good. These guys will suck up a little bit. These will suck up a lot. So uh, I'm going to give everybody a third coat here. This playing it safe up here, playing it safe here. Those guys, I think, could use it just to uh, strengthen them a bit. So we're back to our normal spiel. Once again, we did uh, still have the ability to move it, which is what we were looking for. And uh, we'll get ourselves going. Now, if you are not in sunny Florida, or don't have access to direct sunlight, this all takes a lot longer to dry. And when we talk about it being sticky, it's dry, but sticky. This is with how lacquer cures over time. So these are actually all dry, as dry as they're going to get, but the lacquer takes time to configure itself and, and and cure, which will actually make it hard. With that said, I'm giving 30 minutes between um, coats. However, I'm in Florida. It's probably 89 degrees out, and I'm in direct sun. So if you're doing it in a garage, or you're doing it in other areas of the world that are blessed with more reasonable weather, um, you are going to have to wait quite a bit longer between coats. I'd say an hour to an hour and a half is what you're looking for. If you're not in direct sunlight and it's, it's somewhat colder temperature. If your temperature gets real low, like 50 below, you know, 50 or below, you'll have to do your best. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how to advise you. And you also want to watch out for humidity. This is a little bit like painting anything else. Humidity will make it dry slower. So if it's just rained or you're in a very humid location like Florida, but it's overcast or in the, in the morning, you do want to be mindful of that. So in this case, I picked a day that's sunny. It hasn't rained in a while. It's not very humid out. We've got direct sun, ideal conditions if you can replicate. So right as before, we just stir up our content. It has not separated and it really won't, but it's good to do anyway. We're going to start on our coma here. So you can tell, um, not you can tell, but on this other stone over here, uh, this Uchi right here, Uchi Gamori, if you have a stone that has these chisel marks in it, uh, the, the lacquer is going to want to pull in there. So it can be wise to kind of do that, right, where you're following the chisel mark a little bit and just making sure you don't get too much pulling. As we said before, even though you're making uneven streaks, it'll stabilize out. So it's usually better just to make sure you don't have any major pooling. Uh, but do, do whatever you want. Again, if it pools, all we'll do is wrinkle up a little bit.
And when I put it on here, I'll dip it in, and it's real drippy, and I'll just up against the side a little bit. So there's still plenty on there, but we're not like leaking it everywhere. I find that's a good way to use it. I don't know. You can see it's uh, getting stickier here. It's grabbing the brush more. That's okay. And if you do have a flip over, as I just had, you just grab it and put it upright. Smooth out the sides and keep going. It'll all be alright. It's one of the benefits of doing these multiple coats. And with these type of Nagra, where you've got the, like, the rough side, you just want to make sure you get really into those um, kind of crevices and repositories um, just because as again as the lacquer dries it's going to kind of shrink and if it's not really thoroughly in all those little crevices it may shrink out let me do it a little more it may shrink out and you'll find that you have an area of the, the stone that doesn't have coverage um, which is not ideal. It wouldn't be the end of the world, but the whole point of this is to try to strengthen it and also avoid water ingress uh, in where weird areas of the stone that might crack it. And uh, an area where the water can pool like that would not be ideal. So it's been about an hour since the third coat. Um, you'll hear I don't have the respirator on anymore. We're not going to do any other coats, but the battery died at the end of coat three. So I didn't get to cover everything. Um, I did do the finger underneath the coma and I really just double checked that the sides of these Nagra with horizontal strokes got coverage. Um, sometimes the running up method as we were using can leave a little open marks. So for the last one, I tend to want to do the horizontal movements. Uh, and if we were sealing a big stone like this, I also would have done a horizontal one. Usually when you're painting, you don't want to like cross your strokes, but the lacquer will even that out for us. So we're firmly into the drying phase now. If I wasn't outside with a lot of wind around, I'd still be wearing the respirator. And this, it, none of this is ready to go inside a house or an enclosed area for sure. Um, it'll need at least a day for that. I find though that you're really looking more at like five days for the smell and the fumes to really dissipate. We are comfortable bringing it inside. Um, so I am still going to just grab them real quick and move them off of their area where they were sealed up. And obviously we have some residual lacquer in places where I was wiping the brush up, but that's really what we're looking to avoid is these very dark patches that are still technically wet. So if it's on top of some residual, not going to cause any problem. This way though, later when we pull them off and they're more dry, probably at the end of the day, which as we can see, they still didn't leave anything on my hands. But when we take them in at the end of the day, um, it's going to be a lot less likely to be a battle to pull it off the cardboard. There's still definitely a chance we will find that it'll want to stick a little bit, but you know, it's better than ripping off this whole section of cardboard with the Nagara. Uh, I've really wanted as well, you could move them to a totally separate piece of cardboard, but this stuff that's residual from the brush is, is totally dry due to the, the direct light and the um, wind and whatnot. So yeah, I'm going to leave these until the evening. Um, and then I'll, I'll pull them into an enclosed area in my inside outside porch and they'll live there for probably the next four or five days until the smell has mostly dissipated. Um, they still won't be cured, um, but by that time you can try to see if there's uh, no smell remaining and they might be touchable in this case we might be able to service the surface of it and take off the extra lacquer. Um, but you're really looking at about two weeks 
before these are really strong enough to wear like a firm finger press won't leave a mark or something. Um, that's mostly cured. However, you wouldn't, for instance, want to take these two stones and put the newly lacquered areas together until four weeks has passed. Uh, if you do it before four weeks, you'll find that the lacquer actually wasn't purely or cured and you will kind of lacquer them together. You'll cement them together. Um, after four weeks, though, you can start stacking lacquered things or whatever you want to do, and it will be totally uh, safe to do so. Um, so our, the next portion of the video will be probably in about a week to a week and a half when these are handleable. We'll take a look at our results as well as um, service the sharpening surface of this Komanagara, and they'll go back in uh, for, again, that more extended additional two and a half week drying uh, and then they'll be purely usable and I can you know we can put them away stack them on top of each other or whatever so all right see you then hey everyone so uh, we are about one week into the drying process of these they no longer smell all of the fumes have dissipated off of the lacquer <clears throat> um, and they are definitely no longer sticky now as we discussed they're not fully cured uh, they're probably a fourth to a half way to fully cured. So if we press into them really hard, or we put them into a stone holder here, which we'll use it a little bit, and we really ratchet it down, we will find that it makes a mark within the lacquer. Um, depending on how far you are into the drying process, there's a very good chance still that that mark will, will even out as the rest of the lacquer cures. Um, but you would do to start worrying about that a little bit more when the lacquer is definitely no longer sticky and no longer smells. It means it's in, you know, probably about that halfway mark of being finished. <clears throat> um, these two stones, we just sealed the back on. So I only have them here so we can take a look at the result. You can see we got a pretty nice result that matches the sides. We did not get any wrinkling uh, on these. I mean, there is obviously little wrinkles from the structure of the stone, but it is a nice smooth coat. And uh, the same is true with this one. Just take a brief look so you guys can see how it turned out. Pretty nice. And that leaves us with the various bench and handheld Nagara that we used. Um, all of these came out pretty good. These Nagara, which all took three coats, all came out pretty good. We'll just grab one here so you can take a look. And of course the surface has a structure to itself and this is what it looks like on the bottom. You can see it has a small bit of uh, lacquer here, but we'll get that off uh, as you see um, as we flatten out the surface. So they came out pretty good. Uh, the technique worked and uh, that's what we're pretty much shooting for is that nice standard coat on it. And we talked a lot about how this would end up on the surface. <clears throat> you can see it's flat. We still even did get a little bit of globs, but we avoided most of that by running our finger along the bottom of it. This won't be hard to clean up. I'll show you how to do that here in a little bit. And interestingly enough, the water of air stone that only got two coats actually turned out the worst, because look, there's that wrinkling I was telling you about. This means that too much lacquer pooled here. Um, I think this is, I mean, this stone is not porous at all. It doesn't tend to suck up any of the lacquer. So I think that it just ended up having a lot more lacquer pool in certain areas than our other Nagara. Um, it's still definitely needed. You can see this right here. It's a crack running through the stone. So it needed to have this happen, and even though it's not the prettiest job in the world, it'll most definitely work, and this is now protected from, from cracking due to water ingress. So let's go ahead and take care of these. Uh, we're actually going to do the bench stone first, just because it's a little bit of the harder one. Then we'll take care of all the handhelds, and uh, we'll be good to go to set them aside for about another two to three weeks and uh, let it fully cure out. So. We are going to use a um, stone holder still, just like normal, but it, in this case, because this is not fully dry and it will still get marred a little bit if I press really hard, we're going to use a towel um, as the base. And I'm going to actually wet the towel, just down some, doesn't need to be sopping wet, but I find that having the towel wet and underneath the stone 
one second here. Let me go ahead and grab a water bottle. Um, helps to avoid the imprinting a little bit. So I will wet down the towel, and I'll wet down the stone, just so that they're less likely to want to merge together. And what we really want to make sure is just that this stone has a little bit of resistance to it coming back. So you can see it's caught on the lip of it back here. I don't really have it firmly in the stone holder though. And if I need to, I mean, I can take care of that. I just don't have it adjusted. But what, what I like to avoid at this process is really wrenching the stone down into the stone holder. You know, usually I try to make the stones really secure in the stone holder. Um, but when we're at this stage where it's still technically drying, I prefer it to be a little bit less, you know, pushed on the sides so we don't mar the lacquer any more than we, we have to. So before we jump into things with the knife, which again we'll be pulling gracefully towards us, not with jerky motions, under complete control, we actually want to um, chamfer off the sides here. And what we're going to use for that is a... 140 Toma plate. <clears throat> I'm going to wet the plate down. And uh, when we chamfer off the sides, there's a couple of different ways you could do it. I actually prefer to hold the stone and the Toma, and I'm going to move it like this in a diagonal motion. Now, the big key is again, I'm moving away from where the lacquer is, I'm not trying to pull. I don't want to pull the lacquer off of the stone, I want to push and grind off that middle level. And it doesn't take a lot of effort to eventually work our way through. You know, you're not looking to push a whole lot on it, let the uh, diamond plate do its work. And the reason we do this is because it'll become easier to peel it off with the knife if we have this. See now where we can see the stone and the division between this and that? That'll allow our knife to ride on that line. It'll, it also tends to pull up a little bit of lacquer dust when you do that on the sides. I like to wash it down after I chamfer off each of the sides because that lacquer dust can have a tendency, because it is of course lacquer, to want to um, meld with the lacquer on the sides or the back of your stone. So as you chamfer off each side, it is good to um, take care of that dust so you don't get it sticking on the sides. All right, and here's a good example too, like look at this piece. You know, that would have, uh, that would stick on the side if we didn't get it off here, so. I'm underwater again. You can also potentially wash off your plate for the same reason. Doesn't have to be perfect just to get all the extra bits off. There's no particular amount you have to do this, maybe 10 plus passes, but you'll feel it. You'll feel that it goes from gliding over the lacquer to touching the stone. It's good to just check, make sure you're happy with it all. Pretty good. You can also do that if you want, but be careful because it could pull the lacquer away on the sides. So I prefer to try to stick to the one motions. And then before we're wrapped up, I'm just going to do a double check. Make sure that we're generally looking good. I'm going to do a little bit more on this side. I didn't get it off as much as I would like. It's a little thicker, so just press a little bit harder to get through, get through. And then one last thing you can do if you want is just kind of run around the sides like that, where you, you start on one flat surface and then you kind of go around. Um, it comes a lot easier when the lacquer's not there and that just helps you get the corners. So we're gonna do one last rinse off here. I know that that might have not been perfectly on camera. It's really hard to get it down low enough so you can see it, but I hope that it was clear enough and uh, 
we've gotten the sides off. You see we have this little extraneous piece right here that's just loose. Not a problem though, we'll also get it off with the knife. So we're at the knife stage, and again what we're going to do is we're going to hold it. You're going to just kind of dig it down into the lacquer. Make sure it's up against that surface clean, which in this case maybe I actually can't use the towel. With these little stones it's definitely a lot harder because there's just less weight on the stone. Yeah, let's get rid of the towel. In this case, I'm just, I'm just not gonna put these thumb screws really hard on it, so it still has a little bit of movement. And then what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go like this. And you can see that surface, the surface dots come off pretty easily. And that's all we're looking for here. We're not going crazy. If you want, you can dig a little into the surface of it, but the layer that remains is not thick, and our diamond plate is going to make um, very quick work of it. So you just look for those big areas, run it across the surface, you'll see you get little residual bits here, and easy enough. Make sure you use a, a towel that you use for paint or lacquer that you're not going to use on yourself. and you know, that's as easy as it is. Do maybe do one last wash off to make sure you don't have anything, any extraneous flakes on the side or the back that you don't want. And uh, we are now ready for the diamond plate uh, stage. You could either put a flat diamond plate in the holder, rub the stone on that surface, or if you do have one, uh, you could also do it with the handle or a flat plate on the surface itself. So up to you, neither option is better than the other, so long as you're applying pressure equally on the surface so you're not making an inherently un uneven surface. And we are not looking to press very hard. We will let this do the majority of our work. In this case, I've got to do this a little bit more. And this will happen naturally. You see these little black, these little black uh, residue? That's spun up lacquer from peeling it off with the diamond plate. And once again, we will get those off uh, under the sink when the time comes. So with having it so far forward, I'm going to have to flip it around. And uh, washing it off in, during this process is your friend. You're not going to accidentally wash it off too much. So uh, don't be afraid to do that. So at this point, if this was an Awasado, ooh, I moved a bit. If this was an Awasado, <clears throat> we would prob probably be done. Because this is an Agra stone, it's uh, rather absorbent, and it has absorbed a little bit of the lacquer here. Um, that just means we'll have to dig, well, not dig, but we'll have to sand a little deeper into the stone to get all of that gone. And I mean, realistically, the stone is usable right now if you wanted to uh, leave it this way. Let's try and get it, most of it off. And this is especially well done if the stone is not flat. So for instance, this piece of uh, Komanagar I had gotten was not flat already. So while I might be wasting a little bit of stone at this point where I'm just trying to get the sucked up portion off, the vast majority of this uh, stone 
needed to probably be knocked off anyway because it was not going to be flat for my my uses. All right, let's wash everything off here. We're making progress. Luckily for those who are going to watch this whole process, the, uh, the handheld ones will be quick. This guy's going to take up the majority of our time here. We can see we're through on this side. We just got this left. <clears throat> and naturally, even when I try to be fairly even, I tend to... Uh, wear a little closer to myself with the plate especially when i'm on camera because otherwise i would probably have the stone back here but when i'm forward <clears throat> my weight is always behind the plate so just the way that it is just flip the stone around I'm really not putting hardly any pressure on it. Really just enough to make sure it's making full contact and uh, moving forward. Because you don't want to take off anymore. You don't want to really gouge the surface. And then you just let the uh, diamond grit on the plate do its work. There's also a bit of a good chance of what we're running into here. Since the stone was not flattened before this might have been a little bit of a low corner back here where we're really getting, I don't want to say resistance, but where it's not coming off as easily. So there's a chance we're doing something, some of that flattening work now. All right, we'll do one more run through. And uh, if that's not enough, we'll move on to the handhelds. All right. All right, and we're done. So that was enough. And uh, usually it's good practice just to chamfer it one more time, uh, since we obviously flattened some of it out. This time, not a whole lot, just need to just do one or two passes. Make sure that we uh, get anything we flattened out too much or any residual lacquer on the surface. And, uh, we have it all off. We have nice lacquered sides. We're good to go. Now, I know for sure that there's little marks on this. I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not. And then there's a little bit of marks here and here from it touching the edges of this. Um, again, we're still pretty early on in the curing cycle. They're not deep because I didn't press super hard. I didn't really wrench it down. They'll come out. 
You will notice though that the sides are maybe a little bit sticky still because you exposed under underlying lacquer. Um, before you go to use this, you'll probably want to just cham chamfer it off one more time. But this is ready to use. It's flat and uh, all nice and prepared. So I'm going to set this aside and uh, we're realistically done that one. Now we are on to our handhelds. Um, you, I could use this version if I wanted to, but I do find it goes a little faster with this version. So that's what we're going to use. And uh, these should all go very, very quick. So you can see this is the surface that didn't get the full lacquer. I mean, I'm just going to put it down and go to it. Unlike the large uh, stones, I don't find the need to chamfer these off to begin with. I think this works fine. And then you just chamfer once at the end. You can see this water of air stone is not... It's a very interesting stone. It's a... It is not a hard stone, but it's not porous. So it slurries up real easily, but it does not really want to absorb stuff. It's a very good stone. And uh, eventually I'll make a video on it. You'll get to see it. So we got all of our lacquer off the bottom. Now in this case, because I have two of them, we are going to use this one. I'm going to wash it off just to make sure there's no bits of lacquer still on it from our Coma Nagra, because I saw that there was. And then we are going to chamfer this guy, just holding it, right? You're going to hit it at an angle. And once again, you're not pulling the lacquer, you're pushing away. So we're going to just do this. Four to six times with a 140 is usually sufficient. Just looking for that edge. And then as always, you can kind of go around the corners. That'll get those little bits off. And we're done. We have a nice chamfered off sealed up slurry stone. And uh, we're gonna put this aside. Usually you wanna wipe it down with a towel. Uh, you can let it dry like this for a little bit if you want, but you do wanna ultimately let it dry where the uh, the lacquered sides are not touching the, the ground. Since again, it is curing still a little bit. So you can, you can let it dry out and then make sure you flip it the other way around for the next, for the final next two to three weeks. These guys are gonna slurry even faster. Maybe not. Water of air still really slurried very quick, but these will still be pretty quick. Like the Coma was, these have a tendency, the Gujo Nagra, which are a little softer, definitely have a tendency to suck up some lacquer. We can see it sucked up a little bit there, but we're almost done on this guy. And again, I'm really not pushing hard. Maybe how much you would push to take a pulse, right? Just enough to kind of keep it on the stone. All right, we're good to go. Once again, we just need to do the sides. Now this one has uneven pockets along the sides, so I might do it a little bit more or at a greater angle than I did the water of air. These are calls you can make that, you know, I'm just I'm holding it, I'm doing this. And on this stone, instead of being more vertical, I'm more in just to get past those little pockets. And the pockets really aren't gonna hurt anything either. Once they're smoothed out, you're good to go. All right, once again, we have it it's done. And uh, we're going to do that to the remaining Nagara here. And I suppose while I do so, I can kind of do a little bit of a wrap up. <clears throat> um, you know, the hardest, realistically, once you get the way to do this down, the hardest thing about all of it is getting the cashew lacquer. If you want to use cashew lacquer, it's not easy to get stateside. Um, every once in a while, I, I am able to get a little extra beyond what I would use. I'll put that up on eBay, but I'm not a reliable vendor of it at, by any stretch. Maybe I get one or two cans extra every couple months. And then <clears throat> I don't realize I don't need them for my most immediate projects and uh, then I, I can list them for people. 
but even though they're cheap in Japan, getting them, paying for them to ship here, putting them on eBay, paying for eBay fees, shipping them through eBay, it actually gets rather expensive. So um, I think we talked a little bit in the beginning that you can use uh, nail polish, can use the majority forms of lacquer. I think there's a earth paint, earth lacquer, earthworks, something like that, that makes uh, floor lacquer that you could use that is resin, uh, tree resin, I think, based. I've heard good things about that. Um, I know that that nitro lacquer I discussed is really A-plus stuff, and if you're not uh, going to try to track down any uh, cashew lacquer, that would be my suggestion, would be that nitro lacquer usually used for um, guitars and, and the like. But yeah, again, nail polish is easy to come across, easy to do. Uh, you were going to apply a lot of the same tenants as you did here. Um, you know, it'll just dry a little different. And one positive of using nail polish or really an acrylic paint, right? You could use any like glossy uh, acrylic varnish would work. Um, it's going to dry very quick, uh, except it's not going to be nearly as durable in the long run. So you won't have a, cor a curing process. It'll be done probably 24 hours, I think, is how long it takes for most acrylic paints to dry. And I actually have used acrylic on these, um, not these stones, but stones that are sealed in cashew. If I accidentally find the cashew is cracked or something, I might use a little bit of acrylic paint to touch up the crack, just to uh, seal it up permanently because the cashew lacquer does take a long time, right? It smells, it's got a lot of this thing going on that we've covered. I do think that it has a lot of superior qualities that make it worth it to look at a lacquer as your initial base coat uh, or initial use, but definitely an acrylic, you know, I use like a hard glossy model acrylic um, and that works just fine. You know, I don't, I have used nail polish for whole stone. I don't like it. I, I think it's way too brittle. It doesn't survive long enough. Um, but it's, it works just fine to patch a little tiny hole or something like that. Uh, a little crack in your, your cashew lacquer base. So I think that it definitely has its role to play. And if you don't want to track down lacquer, any, you know, clearish paint, acrylic paint, or probably a clear lacquer paint in general is going to work fine for you. Just always be careful. Lacquer is very bad for you, which is why we always made sure to wear all of our protective equipment. So we're down to our last one. And uh, you can see these are not hard to do. Um, usually they're not hard to do in general, especially the handheld Nagara. If they're soft stone like this, you get through it quickly. If they're hard stone, uh, the lacquer doesn't really soak in. So it tends to be pretty easy. All right, well, I think the camera is going to run out of room here before I finish this last one. So as I work on it, if it ends abruptly, I apologize. But thanks for watching. If you have any questions about the process, feel free to leave a comment. If you liked it, like and subscribe, all the normal YouTube stuff. And if you have any videos in particular you want to see, uh, leave a comment and let me know. I try to produce two a month, and I'll try to get to your suggestion when I can. So, I just beat the clock. Here we go, we got our last one here. And uh, hopefully it gives you guys a guide on how to uh, do cashew lacquer sealing for your own stones. Until next time.